Hello, Jim Benson here uh, for episode two of the JA to JB uh, with Jurgen Apollo, Jim Benson, and JB Rainsberger. I'm Jim Benson, uh, author of The Collaboration Equation <laughs> and co founder of Modus Institute. Uh, if you like the ideas that are talked about in these videos, please do stop by modusinstitute.com. We have a whole global collection of people who are interested in these things and talk about them every day. So today's conversation is bottlenecks are nature's warning you aren't collaborating. Bottlenecks are nature's warning that you aren't collaborating. Uh, so in, in, in the new book, in the collaboration equation, I tell this story about a group that we worked with where they, um, uh, they ignored their database team for a catastrophically long period of time. <laughs> until like literally catastrophic until yeah. literally everything that was going on was on hold because they were waiting for the database group. And of course they blamed the database group for this. And so yeah. we had to come in and do a couple of visualizations and show them, look, no, you've, you've, you've built this system by making them a cost center and not actually making them a valued part of your, of your workflow. And so we had to go convince the board of directors, this company is going to do nothing for a month except fix everyone in the company is going to be working on fixing the database issues. And, and we are going to praise the database people, not, not condemn them. Um, but that bottleneck existed for years, like literally years. And every C-level person in that company had read the goal. Wow. Every single one of them. And none of them did a damn thing about it. <laughs> Were they? Do you think they were all standing around waiting for someone else to do something about it? Or no. Do you think they just that the message went over their head? It's because number one, the goal is told from manufacturing context, so a software company didn't, uh, doesn't didn't, work didn't really yeah. see it. And then, but the second thing is, we naturally, we naturally gulag eyes <laughs> uh, different groups of the company because we don't value them. Uh, yeah. And it might be database people, you know, it might mm -hmm. be sales, it might be customer support, certainly, uh, where we're underutilizing and we're creating either explicit bottlenecks like that one or really hidden ones like with the support teams where support teams are sitting on literally hundreds of millions of dollars worth of customer information that the rest of the company is just ignoring. Hmm. Um, and so I, I see every time I see a bottleneck, I just like, I'm like, where aren't these people working well together? Yeah. Um, it, that seems intuitively obvious to me because one of the, one of the ways that I tend to teach this stuff, um, value stream mapping sounds too artificial and mechanical and weird for people to actually do. So I'll offer them a shortcut and say, well, just look for places where work is waiting. And wherever mm -hmm. work is waiting, there's a pretty good chance there's a bottleneck nearby. Um, and that sort of shortcut seems to match perfectly with what you're saying, right? Because mm -hmm. where do things wait? What are they typically waiting for? They're waiting in someone's inbox. They're waiting for people who aren't willing or don't take the time to get together and talk. So you have stuff going back and you have inbox ping pong or you have other kinds of other reasons that things wait it seems kind of obvious to me that a large reason why things wait is because two people who need to talk to each other aren't doing it mm -hmm. um and that's especially true if you know that uh the bottleneck is waiting because something's going back and forth so this can be something as stupid as pull requests at the micro level uh in software projects um or it can be the kinds of things that you're discussing where you know hoarding information, architects hoarding design decisions, uh, product directors hoarding customer information mm -hmm. or that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it, it just seems like an obvious thing to me. And now the, now the fun part becomes, are they not talking to each other because they don't realize they should? Or are they not talking to each other because I hate you and I don't want to talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> or are they not talking to each other because they've all been given KPIs to chase that are at cross purpose. Oh yes. Being, I guess being distracted maybe is yeah. part of the not realizing how urgent it is to talk. Structurally distracted. Yes. <laughs> Intention, unintentionally, intentionally distracted. True enough. Yes. 
Thank you for thank you for taking the blaming language out. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> but but yes, they can definitely be jerks. No, I or, have... or they can just have had bad experiences together and they don't want to repeat them. I, uh, um, I I completely agree, of course, um, but I want also also want to add something else to the conversation. Uh, thinking uh, recently a lot about Russell Eckhoff and his uh, uh, systems thinking uh, approaches. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of him is, some problems shouldn't be solved. They need to be resolved uh, mm-hmm. by doing something else. The problems will just go away by themselves. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yes, the bottleneck could mean that people are not collaborating. It could also mean that the company is not innovating because you might not need the whole database team anymore when you moved everything to the cloud. Right. And then the bottleneck becomes the internet connection instead of your database people. <laughs> you have a very different bottleneck. Um, so yeah, collaboration is one thing, but uh, by innovating, you could just shake up the entire chain uh, and, and have a completely new one uh, with new bottlenecks because there will always, always be some. Uh, so I don't think it's always a lack of collaboration. Sometimes it might be a lack of innovation. So no problems to be solved, but problems to be resolved by doing something completely different. Yeah, what's the saying that uh, the the it's a crime that when we uh, automate something that we shouldn't be doing at all, mm-hmm. or when we streamline something that we shouldn't <laughs> be doing in the first place. And mm-hmm. I think that's you know, that's one nice thing that comes out of sort of the the lateral thinking. Um, area, right? The idea of not just solving the problem that you see directly in front of you, but asking questions such as, what could we do that just makes this entire pro- this entire class of problems go away? What would make it so that I didn't even have to think about this anymore? Mm-hmm. And somewhat ironically, that kind of thinking might start with one person, but actually putting it into action probably requires a significant amount of collaboration. Mm-hmm. Uh, But somebody needs to start by just asking the question, what if we didn't have to think about this at all? The the offhand statement that you made at the beginning there, JB, was, you know, architects not communicating design decisions. And the Mm -hmm. first thing in my head popped into my head was people still have architects because most of the software companies yep. that I go to, they've just got people randomly doing shit. <laughs> yeah, well, I, that, well, that's the thing, right? So if it, and that's one of the things that's, I, I, in the situations where they do have people just randomly doing shit, which certainly happens, their problem tends to be that nobody is thinking about the bigger picture because they don't have time. They're, exactly. They don't have energy, whatever it is. Or they're not, it's not um, their job. But the people who have, well, yeah, exactly. Nobody has, nobody has created space for that to happen. Mm-hmm. And so then it doesn't happen except by accident. If some well-meaning person happens to volunteer to do it, but then they read about what it means to be an architect or a technical leader. And the, the success literature still tells them 25 year old advice instead of mm-hmm. helping them understand what it means to be an advisor as opposed to courting mm. decisions. Um, that's one thing, you know, something that comes out of the servant leadership uh, culture is this idea of helping people grow. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not sure that someone who is looking around saying, Christ, I think we need an architect. I don't think they're going to think to go pick up books on servant leadership. They're going to look for books that say how to be an architect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the way to be an architect is, you know, they write about it as this completely technical discipline where your job is to build, put up guardrails and mm-hmm. control these code monkeys because otherwise they have no idea what they're doing. And it just it creates this unbelievable blaming culture that's just that, you know, it takes months to establish and years to mm-hmm. get rid of. So, so the, the group that I was talking about when they did sequester the whole company for a month and started working on this stuff, they all started dividing up things to do. And we had to say, do you guys even know what you're doing? And they're like, of course we do. It's like, how? So we took a huge wall and put put a giant architecture diagram up about how the whole system worked. (laughs) And then when anybody pulled tickets to work or fix anything, they would would note on the architecture diagram where they were working and what that Mm. impacted. 
And that meant that people started to see holes in the architecture because it was the first time anybody had ever looked at it before, which gave them opportunities to both solve problems correctly or innovate and, and design them out of existence. Um, and so it, again, it became just the ability of, do, do you actually know what the hell you're doing as opposed to, are you able to do what you were just told to do? And one of my yes. worries about Kanban is that it's a wonderful system to be told to do stuff. Yeah. The same complaint to things like <laughs> getting things done or any of these other, um, workflow management kinds of things, right? Where there's sort of an initial stage where you're trying to get your shit together and get a handle on what you've made commitments to so that you can figure out which things to back out of and which things to haul ass and get done. Mm -hmm. But if you stick with it long enough, you realize this is more about, here I am limiting context again, that <laughs> part of the part of what makes these systems work well involves um creating enough space for you to then think about the big picture and articulate it, mm -hmm. tell it to other people, right? Whether you draw an architecture diagram on the wall or don't, I mean, the mere act of articulating what's going on in your mind to other people forces you to clarify your own understanding and be aware of where maybe you're making limiting assumptions, uh, unstated mm -hmm. assumptions, incorrect assumptions, and... Uh, the less we work together, the less likely we are to articulate what we're thinking to other people. Mm -hmm. And then it just it just becomes this continue this positive feedback loop of um, bad thinking. Yep. I'm, bad I'm assumptions the... on top of bad assumptions on top of bad assumptions and distorted thinking. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm, in, I'm in the football group. Jurgen is is in the the edible cauliflower group, and you're in the fractal mm -hmm. group, and we're working our way towards release. Exactly. Yeah, As yeah. Was, it, it, it refers back to what we, we talked about previously. We have our, our own interpretations of reality and it's easy to even agree with each other and have consensus thinking that we have the same model, well, which, which we don't. But if it's there on the wall, uh, staring at us angrily <laughs> as an <laughs> agenter, uh, it's much harder to ignore uh, the, the the fact that we have different assumptions and, and that things are not what they should be. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, and this I, is why something like talking in examples is so useful in understanding what, what features we're trying to build. Not because we can then automate tests, but because that's how I find out that Jurgen and I have very different ideas about the goal, the intention, or the mm -hmm. details of this feature. Um, and, you know, uh, testing, not just testing, but also dealing with dealing, filing bug reports and dealing with tests reports. That's a perfect example of a small scale bottleneck in software projects. That is a sign that the people asking for features and the people delivering features are not talking to each other often enough about what they're trying to do. They don't share understanding of what the idea is. What happens is, and even if you're if you're doing something like extreme programming and shipping features every two weeks, why would you wait two weeks to find out that you're on the right track or on the wrong track? How could you go wrong with your user story? Right. You, and, you've, made your, you've made your very, very concrete functional requirement into something really vague. How could you possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> well, remember, story, stories are a ticket for a conversation. They're not yes, the they specification are. document. We've only been saying that for 25 years. Somebody will get it eventually. <laughs> get it. Yeah. But they, what they won't get is that they've just committed to doing it in less than two weeks and don't have, now don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if, only there were, if only there were books that would help us with these ideas. <laughs> yeah, some of them it's um, at the beginning of personal Kanban, I tell people this book is not your mom, you know, <laughs> you st <laughs> and, and th all throughout this book, I say repeatedly, please, these are, th this is a book about technique, not recipes. And I know that people are going to be like, I have to do a right environment exercise exactly like this. Mm -hmm. Every, every well, time that's not necessarily bad i mean uh, you know you got to start somewhere yeah yeah just yeah. don't shoo, stop shoo, there shoo, 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 don't shoo. stop yes. there. yeah exactly don't stop there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh this was a great conversation 
Uh, so thanks, thanks guys. And I certainly know who you are, <laughs> uh, but do you want to uh, do a quick kind of post introduction of yourself and then tell people how they can get a hold of you or, or ways that you would like them to learn more about you? And we'll start with Jürgen. Hello there. My name is Jürgen Apollo. I'm in the Netherlands, Rotterdam, awesome city. And uh, I am the author of Management Theater Law and Managing for Happiness. And if you will want to learn more about me, uh, I have a website, yorgonoplo.com. All right. And JB. Hi, I'm uh, JB Rainsberger. Some people call me Joe, and some people just know me as J Brains. Uh, I am, uh, well, let's just say I started life as a programmer, and I can still write code, but I'm much more interested in um in helping programmers figure out how to work with less stress. So whether it has to do with um, technical skills, people skills, planning skills, whatever it takes, whatever the sources of your stress are, I want to try to help you with that. Um, I am, my inbox is always open. You can always go to ask.jbrains.ca. Um, that's .ca for Canada, also an awesome country. Um, and uh as long as you're willing to wait forever for the answer, that service is free. Um, that's part of my, my commitment to you is that I will answer you eventually. And if you need answers sooner, uh, we can talk about how much that costs and you know, it's, it's less expensive than you might think. All right. And um, I'm Jim Benson and I thank uh, both of my guests whom I love dearly and because of COVID have not been able to see in an incredibly long time. I, uh, most recent book on my side is The Collaboration Equation. Look at that little fly out there, isn't that awesome? And uh, uh, also teach at modusinstitute.com and uh, Thank you both for these conversations. This was uh, a wonderful way to, to spend some time. And I very much look forward to seeing you both very soon. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Jim. Love the invite. Thanks, Jim.